You want to fire the countdown again? Okay. Nope. We're good. <laughs> <laughs> What's up, everyone? Welcome to Tuesday Live. We're back. Okay. So here's the deal. We're going to do a little bit of a different stream today. Um, I'm answering a question. It is, I, I honestly think, I didn't do the math on this, so don't quote me, but I honestly think that this is the most asked question I get across all platforms, Instagram, YouTube, TikTok, everywhere. And ironically, it has nothing to do with guitar or pedals or amps or YouTube or any of that stuff. Um, it's to do with my drum sounds. Where do I get my drum sounds and the tracks that I make and produce for the YouTube videos? Where does it all come from? So we have put together kind of a unique streaming system here. Um, and we're hopefully we got all the technical glitches out of the way. Uh, at the front, but uh, basically what we're going to do is pull up an actual Luna session that we're working on right now um, for my next video course, Fretboard Fundamentals Rhythm Guitar Course. Part of that course is going to have uh, jam tracks, play along tracks that we that I produced and wrote specifically for the course. And we're going to work on one today and I'm going to show you my approach to producing and mixing and editing drum sounds. And um, look, if you're not into drum sounds, you're not into production, stick around anyways. This is going to be a typical Q&A live stream. So if you have any kind of guitar recording or production or mixing or playing questions, uh, as we normally do here on Tuesday Q&A, you can uh, at me in the chat, at Rhett Scholl. That will highlight your question so I can see it. Or you can leave a uh, super chat donation, which is very, very uh very, very thankful for helps the channel out. Um, and yeah, so we're going to do a production live stream today. Now, before we jump in a couple of quick announcements, one, um, we are doing 10 coupons for 50% off of any of my video courses. That's the fretboard fundamentals course, the Nashville number system course, and the tone course. There's only 10 of those coupons available. And once they're gone, they're gone. Uh, that is code 5028 at checkout. Uh, and we're not running any other discounts on the course from this live stream. So uh, if you want a course, you want a discount, jump on one of those coupons. Link is in the description and in the chat. And uh, also, we are happy to announce that the new Inner Circle platform is launching. We've been working really hard behind the scenes for the last several months to get this new Circle platform up and running. And uh, it launched late last week. So... We've got a really cool, really tight community of people over there right now, and uh, we're doing things like our monthly Zoom hangs, uh, getting together with people on Zoom. We are doing some behind the scenes stuff. I've posted a few behind the scenes video. I've gotten some questions from uh, Circle members about like this live streaming setup, you know, how I've got all this stuff patched together for Zoom calls, live streams. So I did a whole behind the scenes video for that uh, over the weekend. And uh, actually, I'll probably go into more depth on how we got this live stream set up today because I'm pretty proud of it. Um, but you'll see that in just a second. So uh, if you want to sign up for Inner Circle, it's 10 bucks a month. You get access to the Circle platform and you'll get early access to my new video course, uh, the Rhythm Guitar course as it's coming out. So with all that out of the way, let's jump over to my Luna session that I've got pulled up here. So I'm going to switch over here. This is a track that I've been working on for the past couple of days as part of the, oh, we got a top chat already. Hold on, this is the first time I'm seeing the chat, so let me get caught up here. Um, Scott Baines, thanks so much, Lumber Fun. Hope the build is going well. <laughs> thanks, man. Um, so the studio build is going. I don't know that I would say it's going well, but it is going. I posted a short this morning about it, um, a quick update. Basically, I... I need a framing crew. I need a, a contractor because we have to hang some LVLs. There's some structural work that needs to be done to the house that I can't do myself. Um, and so <laughs> trying to find a contractor and a framing crew right now is the, it's obscenely difficult. So, uh, it is going, but, um, anyways, let's see here. Quentin James, are you and Lawrence from Lawrence Petros having a girl fight? No. And I don't know what that means. Um, all right, so let's take a look at this session here. So as I said at the beginning, this is a track that will be available with the rhythm guitar course. Um, this is part of, it's like a Hendrix inspired track. And uh, basically what we have here is a, a drum track, a bass and a single guitar track. Now, a quick disclaimer, this song 
is very much a work in progress. This is not done. I'm, you know, kind of taking a step into the unknown by showing this here on the YouTube channel. But again, I want to talk about how I get my drum sounds. And uh, because I'm working out of a bedroom studio currently, I don't have a place to track real drums. So I'm using um, drum loops a lot and I'm using plugins a lot. So we're going to go over that today. But um, this track is very Hendrix inspired. The part of the course that this is going to go along with is like, you know, outlining chords and combining lead playing and rhythm playing a la Hendrix and John Mayer and Stevie Ray Vaughan and all those great players the way they used to do. So I will quickly play you a little section of it here so you can kind of get an idea of what we're working with and then we'll take a closer look at the, uh, the drum stuff. So that's a that's a little bit of it. There's this this pre-chorus section, this key change that that uh, puts together for it. So here's the drum sounds. Now, like I said a second ago, I don't have a place to track drums right now. I'm working out of a bedroom studio. So um, there's two sort of avenues that I go down when I'm thinking about a drum track. Uh, avenue one is using a drum programming plugin like Superior Drummer. And this is one I've been using for a really long time. Uh, I bought this years ago. Stream's not sponsored by anybody. Um, and this is, this is something I've been using. I actually picked up on this software from uh, actually working at Rick Beato's studio years ago. We would use the, the predecessor version of this. Um, and it sounds really, really good. There's tons of different drum samples and drum kits in here. And I have to say, like, it sounds pretty lifelike. So what we did here uh, was actually producer Chris, former assistant, Chris now turn hey, producer Chris. I'm still here. <laughs> uh, I had Chris actually program this groove the other day. Um, and we, again, the, the idea behind this track is it's going in the rhythm guitar course and it's a la a Hendrix vibe, right? So we went with sort of the more marching kind of Hendrix style stuff as a reference. And we, uh, we came up with this. Let me get my, uh, we'll just do, we'll loop this B section into the pre-chorus into the chorus here. So we'll just play this. So Chris programmed this and then I came back and edited some of it. I changed some of the fills around, uh, trying to get it a little more simple, meat and potatoes straight ahead because the idea behind this track is to have people play along with it. Uh, people of all skill levels to be able to play along with it. So the way this will work is I'll have several different mixes in the course. So you'll have the full mix. So you can hear my guitar parts and what I did. And then there will be a lead guitar out. So there's just rhythm guitar parts if you want to just play lead on top of it. And then there will be a complete guitar out mix, which will just be everything except the guitars that the people taking the course can go in and play along with. So the idea here is to keep the groove relatively straight ahead and I will bring in the, uh, the bass as well so you can hear the bass working together with the drums. So in terms of, uh, actually, let's, let's get, got some questions here. I've skipped over. Let me see here. Maverick, uh, Merrick, cool tune. Univibe all over that. Thanks, man. Yeah. Something we're, uh, we're working on. Um, Island Sound says, what are your thoughts on solid state amps? And are there any that you like? I do like solid state amps. 
Um, the Roland JC120 is a classic staple uh, solid state amp. I like some of the quilter stuff that I've played. I haven't spent a ton of time with the quilter stuff. I think my favorite sort of solid state amps, uh, and by that I mean non tube driven amps, are the Fender Tone Master series. I really love the Tone Master Super Reverb. Um, yeah, let's see here. Uh, someone was asking about the panning as well. Oh, yeah, the panning. So right now there's not any panning going on, but we might play around with some panning in just a minute. Right now, the only thing is I've got the guitar. There's one guitar track on here. There might be two or three others, uh, and it's panned, uh, you know, right here on the dial about 3 o'clock, so about 50% to the right. And um, let's see, I'll unsolo everything so you can kind of hear what's going on. Here's the guitar by itself. So that is my uh, American Pro 2 Strat going through the Univibe, going into the Marshall Plexi, uh, and then into the Ox. So let me explain what's going on here with these uh, subtracks over here. I like to bus pretty much everything that I do, and I'm, I'm using Luna here. Uh, part of what I like about Luna is you get a lot of really cool options on the summing side and like the tape saturation and compression side. Basically, I think what UA is trying to do with Luna is build it into like a console style workflow, but in the box and your computer. So you have summing, you've got Neve and API summing, um, you've got, you know, master tape machines, you've got bus compression right now. It's just an API style bus compression. So what I like to do is take advantage of all of that stuff as much as I can when I'm using, uh, like when I'm just mixing and doing these tracks. So I've done that here with the drums. So this orange drum track right here, this is what we're hearing. This is the superior drummer drum track. Let me close the grid editor here. Um, oops, something is soloed. What is that? Okay. Guitar solo. So right now what I have is this drum track is bust out uh it's sent to this drum sub this bus right here so you're not actually hearing the drums coming from this track they're going through this drum sub track right here first and so what's happening is we're going through a neve style summing mixer right and then it's hitting this uh atr tape machine and i like this setting here called pushed drum bus this is a good starter for me it's really pushing it's like a, a tape saturation adding a lot of compression the, the style of drum sound that i'm going for on this track is really saturated pretty compressed um kind of dark you know mid to late 1960s rock and roll hendrix kind of sound so if you watch these vu meters here over on the left uh you should see i'm hitting the tape relatively hard And if I push that up, I can get more tape saturation out of it. And then from there, I'm going into this API bus compressor. And it's just barely like, it's just barely kissing the drums. It's really not doing much. If you watch these meters here, this is on the, the gain reduction meter here. Now I could get more compression out of it if I push this threshold up. And then bring my output gain back. And if you listen to if you listen to the cymbals now, I mean that's really compressed. It's elongating the sustain on the cymbals and the kick is really really compressing the overheads. That's a little too much compression for me, so we'll go back. And I am watching my meters here on the uh, the drum bus. You know, I'm looking for about mm, between the six and nine here on the meter. So there's that. And then uh, from there, I've got a Pultec EQ because one thing we were noticing without this EQ is the symbols were really bright and really washy. So we were kind of losing a lot of top end information. And the low end, there's a ton of low end in these superior drummer 
uh, samples, especially like these kick sounds. It's honestly, that's probably my one thing about Superior Drummer that I don't dig is the crazy amount of low end that comes from them. So what we've got here is this pull tech style EQ pulled up and I've got 60 Hertz and I'm attenuating uh, about two and a half there. And we tried the pull tech trick, you know, if you attenuate and boost at the same time, but it was kind of making the low end, the kick sort of fall apart. Here's without it. You hear how flubby the low end gets? So that's just kind of tightening up the bottom end. Atlas Clouded in the chats asking, you've mentioned running tracks through outboard gear, such as the Strymon Deco. Could you talk about how you might create a send and how that signal flow would work? I can. So um, it depends on your specific setup but let's say you're working with the typical like four or maybe an eight channel interface most modern interfaces that you use nowadays have inputs and they also have outputs so what you would do is in your daw you would uh first of all take your piece of gear that you want to patch into your mix so let's take the deco for example and you would plug it into your interface so let's say you just wanted to go mono in mono out for the sake of argument here. So I'd take a cable and I would go from the output, one of the outputs on my uh, on my interface, let's say it was output number one, and I'd go into the pedal. I'd go out of the pedal into a channel on my interface, let's just say into channel one. So then what you would do is in your DAW, you would create a new track. So here I'm gonna just say a mono track and I would say FX return, okay? This is all for example, I'm not actually patching this in right now. And then I would set the input of that track to whatever input on my interface I was using to bring the return back in, the effect back in. So once you have that, you can kind of think of it as like, almost like using an effects loop on your amplifier, the send and return sort of workflows, signal flow is the same. So once you have that effects return, you wanna record enable it or input monitor it so you can hear the return coming from your effect from your pedal. Um, and then you would need to create some kind of send, right? Because you need to get whatever it is that's in your DAW out to the pedal and back. So let's say, for example, I wanted to take this, uh, this guitar two right here, and I wanted to send that through the deco. Well, in Luna here, I have a section for sends. So I'd click this send and I'd say, okay, let's send it out a line one. So on my interface, that's line output one that I use to patch the pedal in. So now I've got a full signal line, signal flow set up, but I need to bring the output up. So this fader here would come up and that's the amount of signal that I'm sending to the deco. Um, oftentimes you'll have options of doing pre fader. That's what this P is right here. And what that does is no matter what happens to this fader here up or down, it's not going to affect the amount of level I'm sending to the piece of outboard gear. So, and then you would record enable your effects return and you could monitor off of that. You could solo that to just hear the amount of effect that's coming back. And then you could print it. So you could essentially hit record and record just the effect return track and blend it in underneath. That's one way to do it. Um, the way I do it, because I have a, I have a patch bay and a piece of outboard gear called the EXTC from Radial, uh, that is a piece of gear that's designed to let you patch in pedals really, really easily. So that's part of my patch bay, and I just use the patch bay to do essentially that same thing. So hopefully that works, or helps, I should say. Um, T. Acreage, what advice can you give all right players that are older what advice can you give all right players that are older about getting better gigs do they still have a chance i think so um and i would say it's pretty much the same advice i would give just about anybody who was uh trying to get gigs and that is first of all go to where the people are who are playing so if there's open jams happening um if there's open mic nights happening where there's artists, there's people who are playing, people who are looking for musicians to play with. That's a really good place to hang out uh, and just make friends with people. Don't go there and try and network. Don't go there and make it known that you're looking for a gig, you're trying to hustle for a gig. Go there, show up consistently. If you're asked to play, get up and play. Uh, take the advantage to play when the opportunity arises and just be a good hang, right? So, um, 
Let's see here. Patrick's Chef, any thoughts on the Blue Guitar Amp 1 Mercury Edition? You know, I've actually never played the Blue Guitar Amp 1. Um, Rick has one, but I've never played it. So I, I genuinely don't know. I don't have an opinion on it. So uh, what software is this? My knees hurt. This is Luna. This is uh, Luna from Universal Audio. Um, but the stuff we're talking about here, these concepts work no matter what DAW you happen to be using. So um, quick plug. Remember, there are 10 coupon codes left for 50% off of any of my video courses. Uh, I think there's less than 10 left now. So if you want 50% off of the National Number System course, the Tone course, or Fretboard Fundamentals, you can use the code 5028 at checkout. Also, if you're new here, check out the Inner Circle. We just launched the new Inner Circle platform, something we've been working on for a long time. And uh, yeah, we've had a really good time setting that up. So, uh, all right. So that's kind of my workflow so far. So we left off on the EQ here. I'm, I was trying to tighten up the low end of the kick uh, and I'll, I'll solo the drum sub here. So it's a little easy to, to see here. Uh, <laughs> Tom, I'm not new here. <laughs> I know. Now there's a cool trick with pull tech EQs that you can do the way this EQ works. If you've never seen something like this, um, is basically right here, it's essentially like a two band EQ. We have a high frequency band and a low frequency band. This lets you select what part of the frequency spectrum you're working with. And then you can either attenuate, which is to cut down, or you can boost that particular frequency. But there's an interesting thing that happens with the pull tech EQs where you can boost and attenuate at the same time. Um, and it has kind of a cool effect. We'll do it with the high end here with the so right now I've got the high frequency set at 10K. That's going to be affecting like the cymbals and the top end and the air of the drums. And you'll hear as I attenuate, as I bring up the attenuation, the level of high end goes down. It's a little counter counterintuitive, but. So it gets much, much darker, much brighter, but I can attenuate and then also boost at the same time. And you hear how the frequency sort of shifts. Kind of an interesting effect there. Right? So I like that. It's kind of a darkening effect. I don't like super bright, washy symbols to begin with. I, I usually try and keep things a little bit darker, a little bit drier. So then from there, um, I'm going into radiator. Now this is a plugin. If you don't have radiator or you don't have little radiator, uh, from sound toys, this is definitely worth the investment. You can use this on everything. Absolutely everything. Um, I use it on bass. I use it on guitars. It's basically a distortion plugin. Um, and here I'm just using it to add a little bit of grit and attenuate some of the treble. So I'll turn it off. So you can hear it gets a little bit darker. The kick gets a little fatter. And if I push the input, you'll hear, really hear it start to distort the drums. There's what the input really low. So I'm using it to add a little bit of saturation and I only have the mix about halfway. So it's half dry drums and half of the wet affected signal coming through. And basically I'm using this to get the drums to kind of sit in the overall mix a little bit better. So Jacob's asking, do you put distortion on the whole kit or just a particular part? In this case, because it's on the drum bus, I'm putting the distortion on the whole kit. Um, and because I'm using Superior Drummer, the plugin, I've just got one track. Now what you could do, it's a little bit more tedious, you could essentially expand every part of this kit onto a different track to make it a little bit more easier to mix. I don't typically do that because with my workflow, I'm typically producing songs that are going as parts of video. So there's a lot of other stuff that has to get done and then the video has to go out. So I don't have like days and days to spend on, on these mixes. I like to work fast. Um, however, when it, when the studio's done, 
Um, that's one thing I want to start doing is really taking more time, uh, especially on tracks that I'm going to put out. This is sort of my fast and dirty YouTube workflow here. So that's what's on the drum sub right now. Also, shout out to Chris, who also played bass on this yesterday. <laughs> Producer Chris. <laughs> yeah, it was good. I, I just, I took a chance. Normally, I play bass on everything. Normally, I kind of suck at bass, but. Yeah, I don't well, I don't, I don't, this I think, sounds good. I think I drank my good bass playing juice. That <laughs> yeah, I, I took a chance. I was like, you know what? He did a good job programming the, this drum loop. Let me let him play bass here. And this is what he came up with. Yeah, it's cool, man. Thanks, man. Appreciate it. I mean, you know. Uh, speaking of bass, Randolph Gallagher, he says, any tips for mixing bass? Ah, mixing bass. That's well, segue. Okay, so the thing, then, everyone, please, please take into consideration the fact that uh, I am not a professional mix engineer. There are people out there, especially there are a lot of people here on YouTube that are far more experienced mix engineers than I am. I'm doing this as a way to finally answer the question that I get asked all the time, which is about the drum sounds. Um, so with that said though, there's a couple of tricks that I like to do. First of all, when it comes to mixing, always start with the best source that you can. That will make everything so much easier when it comes to mixing and get, getting your projects and your things to sound good, is to start with a good source. So get your tone right, get your part right, make sure you're playing things the right way. Um, make sure the, the attack of the bass is how you want it. The thing with mixing is you don't want to treat it like, you're not gonna fix any major issues with your source material in the mix. So you really wanna take the time to get it right. Um, and you wanna know what you're looking for before you go into it. So for this, with the bass sound, I knew what I wanted to hear in my head, which was uh, a really saturated sort of P bass into a cranked Ampeg SVT kind of thing. And this is what we came up with. So that's the P bass that's going into my Zod Audio DI. My friend Dan Derlo builds these amazing tube DIs called Zod Audio. And then from there, if we record enable this track, I have the uh, Ampeg SVTR plugin from UA. And this is basically acting as my bass amplifier. And I've got quite a bit of distortion, quite a bit of breakup coming from the amp. And then the way I always do my bass tracks is the Neve 1073 with this exact setup i'm boosting quite a bit of 360 i'm boosting a little bit of 110 and then i'm high passing at 80. Uh, and then from there i'm going into the 1176. this is a classic bass guitar i mean the 1176 is used on everything but i love it on bass it adds a little bit of color a little bit of saturation um, and then from there i'm also bussing the bass track just like i am the drum loop so i'm getting some neve summing on uh, I'm getting some tape saturation on, and then I'm getting a bus compressor on as well. So you can see the, the bus compressor is doing quite a bit here. It's getting... But again, that's the bass sound I wanted. I wanted really punchy, really gritty, muffled, kind of warm. Like it's, I wanted the bass to be sounded like it was wrapped in like a wool blanket, basically. Robbie Thrash says you could do this on another channel. I'd watch every episode. It's funny that you say that Robbie, because we have plans. I have plans to basically take my second channel, Rhett Scholl studio and turn it into the studio and production channel. There's so many videos and topics that I want to cover 
that aren't quite right for this channel because this is a guitar channel. In fact, this live stream, I think, is kind of a departure of what I typically do, but whatever. Um, but yeah, the second channel is going to become, when the studio is done downstairs, that's going to become the studio channel. And I want to make videos not just about music production and mixing, but also things like video production, lighting, uh, how to live stream, how to do podcasting, all these different skill sets that I've learned over the last four or five years of doing this for a living. Uh, I want to start to share that with people um, because I think these are really important skill sets for musicians to have, honestly. Uh, A, it's really fun to do. It's really fun to learn how to mix and record and and get your sounds right. B, it's a really marketable skill set to have. If you're a player and you want to make a living as a player, Chris and I were talking about this um, <laughs> right before the stream, right before the stream, my wife's blowing me up uh, to plug the coupons again. Again, you can get 50% off of any video course you want code 500 to eight at checkout. There are six courses. There's six coupons available left, I think. So if you want 50% off of any of the courses, once they're gone, they're gone. So, um, yeah, but that's the idea behind the second channel is to teach these skill sets. Cause I think for people that want to be working musicians, nowadays these are pretty critical skill sets to have um you need to know how to mix and record yourself even if you don't plan on becoming a full-time mix engineer or producer knowing how to do this stuff at a decent level will open up so many doors and opportunities for you uh knowing how to do video production knowing how to edit your own videos knowing how to light stuff knowing how a camera works knowing how to do live streaming things like that it can really do a lot for you. So that's the idea behind the second channel. It doesn't have a name yet because the studio doesn't have a name yet. Um, but that's the idea. So actually in the chat, what would actually be really helpful for those of you that are watching, um, let me know if you're interested in that kind of stuff, what types of videos do you want to see in that realm? So think video production, music production, podcasting, live streaming, running a YouTube channel, social media stuff. Uh, on that channel because I have a lot of ideas, but I'm not sure what people are interested in, what they're not interested in. So, all right, let's see here. What I questions? Got an interesting question from Jacob Sandnez. He says, what's the breaking point in your opinion for a source needing to be re-recorded?" Ah, yeah. Oh, that's an interesting question. Well, I would say a couple of things. One, if the performance isn't there or the tuning isn't there. So actually with this bass track that Chris recorded yesterday, I had him put the bass track down and then I came down and put the guitar track down and I noticed that there were some tuning issues and I asked Chris, I was like, Hey, did you tune the the bass guitar before you record it? Nah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so that was a, that was a threshold, right? That was a, a thing that we crossed. It was like, okay, we need to re-record. And honestly, it was a really good take. It was kind of a bummer um, because it was a good take, but yeah, there was some tears shed. It, it was just out of tune. So <laughs> lesson learned right? Yeah. Um, things like that. If the performance isn't right, if the tuning or the intonation is not quite right, if, if you absolutely had to, there are some tricks you can do to fix that kind of stuff. But the reality is like, you really want that stuff to be right. Now, in terms of tone, this uh, is why I say, take the time to get it right on the way in. If you can get the things sounding right on the way in, then the mixing process is that much easier. Um, but if you, if you rush through the recording process and the mic's placement wasn't quite right, or the, the EQ coming in, or there's too much compression on something, it's really hard to come back from that. So, yeah, this is something I, I actually have a genuine question about like how important in that sense is gain staging. Like what, what would you consider to be like something you need to be recut because of gain staging? Yeah. Gain staging is super important. And that's a, that's a whole subject in and of itself. Um, and there's a lot of people out there that can explain it better and in a more technical way than I can, but essentially gain staging on the way in is something to really pay attention to because if a signal coming in is too hot, especially if you're using, you know, modern preamps that, you know, clip in a really harsh way they distort in a really harsh way um or you just don't have enough headroom to work with later in your mix then it it just makes the mix process really really difficult um so getting your gain staging right i typically track coming in a lot hotter than a, a lot of my friends like ian guthrie for example ian tracks super quiet coming into 
his mixes because he wants to have a lot of headroom to work with with his plugins and his mixing later. Hmm. I like a lot of saturation, uh, especially when I'm using analog like outboard preamps and and uh, compressors and EQ. So I'm not afraid to hit stuff a little harder. Right. But it's taken me a long time to learn by screwing up a bunch of mixes because my gain coming in was way too hot that uh, it's better to kind of err on the side of caution, give yourself more room to work with later. Um, and so, so as long as you're not dealing with like a crazy noise floor or something, quieter is better than too hot? Generally. But again, it's kind of like what... The thing to keep in mind with this stuff is there's no right or wrong. Mm. This is art at the end of the day. So it's like if you like the sound of clipping the hell out of like your preamp on your interface you like that like super harsh digital distortion then hyper pop man i mean yeah then by all means that's not wrong but if you're looking for a specific like this track we were looking for yesterday i had a specific sound in mind i wanted late 60s pretty saturated to tape um not a pretty mix not a super balanced and clear and like polished mix i wanted it to feel rough and dirty and gross kind of and i think i think we're kind of there <laughs> um all right only five coupons left with code 5028 at checkout um let's get caught up on some of these uh eric says also nail your tempo down yes that's very important get your tempo right because that's really hard to fix later if you get a whole track done or you get drums done and you're like ah it's too slow we need to we need to push it up a little bit yeah. You'll have to re-record. That actually happened to us in Germany back in November. One of the songs we did, we tracked, we got the whole take and then came back like two or three days later and we're listening to it. And the producer, we all just decided like, it's too slow. It's too, or no, it was too fast. We need to slow it down. So we had to go in and completely re-record the whole thing. Um, let's see here. <laughs> no B studio for the new channel name. You're welcome. <laughs> um, I've got a pretty interesting question here. Okay. Um, RC Santiago, he says, in order to, ve to develop their skills, is there anything that a musician should invest their time and money in that has nothing to do with music? Sorry, read that one more time. I was catching up with comments. Uh, should, what should you invest in as a musician that has nothing to do with music? Like to, to hone your skills. Ooh. Yeah, what are some good non-music related skills that musicians should have? Um, time management and scheduling so like being able to to work honestly some business chops because th this is something that i never learned in music school or in school school like learning how to do your it's not a fun sexy answer it just really isn't but it's true learning how to handle your money um learning how to do your taxes if you're going to be a professional musician you are a business you are a sole proprietor and, and you are taxed and, and treated as such in the eyes of the government. So learning how to do your taxes and learning how to take advantage of things like tracking your mileage. Okay. I'm going to, I'm going to plug an app. I am not associated with them at all, but I've been using them for years. The QuickBooks self-employed app. If you are a musician and you're making a living from your music, um, you need to be using this app. It's QuickBooks self-employed. It keeps track of things like your mileage. Like if you teach guitar lessons and you're driving around to your students, that mileage is a tax write-off. Um, the gear and things that you purchase, like learning how to handle all that stuff is incredibly important for, for musicians. And people don't talk about it because it sucks. It's boring and nobody likes to talk about taxes and finances, but it's true. Um, outside of that, I think it kind of depends on what you want to do musically. Like, uh, do you want to be on the more production side of things? Then you should be investing in those kind of skill sets. Spend time on YouTube on some of the great production and engineering and mixing channels. Um, maybe invest in some video courses from some of those creators or from famous uh, like mix engineers and people that you like to do. You should be listening to a lot of music. Um, video production i i got i got interested in photography and video production 10 years ago way before i ever thought about doing a youtube channel and learning about that stuff learning about how cameras worked and being fascinated by that made the transition into doing youtube that much more easy and enjoyable for me so yeah that's uh that's it yeah yeah um, all right, let's move on to one more thing here and then we'll continue to take some questions. So on the drum sound thing, 
This is one way I like to do it with Superior Drummer, but the other way I like to do it is by using drum loops. I use drum loops all the time. Um, this is a drum loop from Aaron Sterling's pack from That Sound Drums. I use That Sound Drums all the time. Not affiliated with them, not sponsored. I've bought all the stuff. Aaron Sterling is one of my favorite drummers alive today. He's amazing. Sterloid on Instagram. If you don't follow him, you should because he's the shit. Um, but this is just a, a quick little um, eight bar loop that I put together from uh, one of his loop packs that I purchased. And right now there's nothing on this. Okay. We just have this track right here and it's going straight to this master track. So you are hearing a little bit of Neve summing some tape and some bus compression on the master bus, but we're gonna work with this a little bit more. So here is the drums by itself. So it's pretty cool. And right out of the gate, there's already some nice compression and some saturation here, but um, we're gonna really kind of transform this and have some fun with it. So what I'm gonna do is create a new bus just for this. So I'm gonna call this Sterloid Bus. And then I have to change the output, hold on. Cause I'm, there we go. All right, so right now on this Sterloid Bus, we're not hearing anything. We're not hearing any summing or any master tape or anything. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and get that set up. We're gonna do some, actually, you know what, for this example, I'm gonna turn off all this stuff on the master section. All right, so we do have a mastering plugin here. It's getting a little bit of compression, some EQ. Uh, but we're gonna add API summing. some master tape and then before I add the compression I'm gonna push the summing mixer a little bit and then I'm gonna go to this tape plugin and there's a few presets in here that I really like like vintage soul is cool vintage lo-fi is cool oh I like that a lot actually so let's yeah that's hey, without it kind of tame that snare drum a little bit yeah it's cool there it is on oh yeah switch to the the daw people can't see the doll oh right yeah there we go so all right, so this is my tape plugin here. I added some API summing here. We're on this Sterloid bus. Now, I'm gonna skip the console compression here because I don't think we're, we need it. We're getting some nice compression from the tape. What I wanna do instead, this is like my secret weapon. And this is a pretty popular this is a pretty popular plugin these days, but I really love this. Um, I use it on drums all the time. And again, this is not sponsored, but the Good Hertz Wolf Compressor, this is my favorite thing in the world. Um, he's not watching his program monitor. Sorry, John, we fixed it. So this is a compressor plugin that was uh, developed in collaboration with Wolfpack. And as far as I know, I don't remember which pieces of gear they modeled for it, but this thing does a lot. This is, I would have this on my list of plugins to buy. It's so cool. Um, it does a lot. So basically what we have here, this is our drum loop that we're starting with. And this is my starter preset that I basically build everything off of. So here it is with no Wolf comp. Here it is with it on. I mean, that's a drastic change. Let me turn the output volume back down. It's almost like we turned on some room mics that we're not hearing before. Like listen to how much more ambience there is in the kick drum.
Wow. Right? And that's only 30% of the compression dialed in here. Now there's some really cool plugins that I like to use. So that's called Punch and Crunch. Lots of attack. Heavy clipping. This is two bus blue. I like this one a lot. Then you have these up here, Wolfmon. It's a sad whirly. If you want that kind of lo-fi sort of thing. Uh, DK effects is cool too. So some, you can add some flange, some stereo panning. Whoa. You hear that? Yeah. <laughs> it's so cool, man. All right. So we're going to go back to, uh, two bus glue. And then I'm going to bring it up a little bit to like 50%. that output volume back down so over here we've got some lo-fi settings um, and then so here it is with it off I mean, that's pretty cool. That's a, that's really cool. Yeah. Honestly, most of the drum sounds that have been heard on the tracks and on my channel are, this has something to do with most of them. Honestly, it's, uh, it's my go-to it's because it's, you just put it on and it's instantly cool. Now, again, I'm not a super polished mix kind of guy. I don't like things that sound very, very clean and pretty. Um, I, I really like things that basically anything that like Chad Blake has, has ever mixed. He's my favorite mix engineer by far. I love Chad Blake's work. Um, yeah, that, that's kind of my, my thing. So I like things that are distorted, pretty compressed, pretty saturated. And, uh, you know, so there you go. Yeah. There's a couple of good questions yeah. in, the, in the chat. Uh, what mic are you using right now? Uh, this is a U87, which I completely understand is overkill for the con the situation that I'm using it in right now. So, um, but yeah, I love this mic. I've had it for about six or seven years now. I'd like to get another one so I can have a stereo pair. Um, but yeah, U87 AI. It's one of the new ones. And then by using Luna, are you eliminating the UA console or? Uh, well, in the mix process... I am because I'm monitoring off of Luna here. Um, but, and the other thing I like about Yuna is it, uh, Yuna, Luna, is that it uses uh, the DSP really, really well. Now that Luna is not perfect. There are some, some issues with it still, namely um, if you are using console, uh, there's an issue that I haven't been able to figure out where if you're using the Q mixes here, and you adjust a track, like you, let's say you record enable and unrecord enable a track in Luna, for some reason it completely resets your Q mixes in console. And I cannot figure that out. But um, otherwise I really like it. I like the way it sounds. It works sort of like Pro Tools, the, the hotkeys and everything are the same. So yeah. Um, Have I announced the pedal board winner yet, Matt? Not yet. So we have a winner for the pedal board giveaway, but they have not responded to their email saying that they are the winner. So we're, we've sent out another email today. And if they don't respond in the next day or two, unfortunately, we're going to pick a new winner. So um, check your email, people. If you entered the <laughs> giveaway, <laughs> check your email because we emailed you. Um, so as soon as we hear back on that, we will announce the pedal board winner. Wilson Leonardo, he says, any good DAW to start mixing in my bedroom? Yeah, there's lots. Um, here's the thing about picking a DAW. Pick one that fits your budget, fits your com current computer, your machine, right? So um, Luna, for example, is free if you have Apollo hardware. Um, if you don't have Apollo hardware, you know, so 
do your research, find something, and then spend your time really learning that DAW inside and out, whether it's Logic or Studio One or Pro Tools or Ableton. It doesn't really matter. They all have their pros and cons. They all have their strengths and weaknesses. But at the end of the day, it's about how well do you know that program? How fast are you in it? Can it do the things that you want it to do quickly? That's that's the thing. So rather than recommending, like so for me, Logic, for example, I hate Logic. I hate Logic with the burning passion of a billion suns. <laughs> but I know that people love Logic and it works really well for millions and millions of people out there. I'm just not one of those people. The way it's laid out, because I learned on Pro Tools, um, it just doesn't work for me. I'm more of like you know a Pro Tools or Luna. That's why I like Luna is because it feels like Pro Tools to me. Um, quick announcement, just a handful of those 50% off coupons left. Remember, if you want 50% off of any of my video courses, links in the description. Use code 5028 at checkout. There's only, I think, a two or three of those left. Uh, and also, check out the Inner Circle. We've been looking at it, working on it. You want to fire that uh, thing again? We've been working on this behind the scenes for quite a few months now, and we just launched the new Circle platform. We have a few Circle members here in the chat I've seen. Um, but yeah, this is like basically my sort of behind the scenes community we have uh monthly zoom hangs where we get on zoom and and talk for honestly hours at a time they're a lot of fun i've been posting some behind the scenes content over there um so yeah if you're interested check out the links 10 bucks a month you can also get early access to my new video course that we're working on right now the rhythm guitar course uh so yeah that is all linked down below all right Tom says logic is what I use, but it should be called illogic. And that's my thing. The way logic works and the way you interact with it is just so frustrating for me that I can't use it. I, every time I get on the logic train, I just get mad and go back to something else. So. Um, okay. Let's see here. Dave. Revere says, noob question, when recording a track, do you use direct monitoring or monitor from the track in the DAW? Reaper seems to have quite a bit of delay in monitoring. So when you're recording, I would say whatever option is giving you the lowest latency. That's the most important thing. Um, in Luna, they have a thing called ARM mode, which is up here, this little orange circle. And this disables the buses. It disables a lot of the DSP. Um, and it gets the latency really, really low so you can track and play in time. So whether that's input monitoring uh, or whatever it is in your DAW, that's, that's what I would tell you to do. Uh, see, David says Reaper is very bare bones, but it lets you install your own plugins and is fairly easy to use once you get used to it. Yeah, I know Reaper is a really, really popular option with a lot of, uh, a lot of people. Casey asked why I hate logic. I hope you heard my, my description. Basically it's just, it just doesn't work for me. The way it's laid out, the way you interact with it. It's not, it's not my thing. Um, awesome. Cool. Well, I think that's going to do it for today, everyone. That was uh, something a little off the beaten path of what we typically do here on the channel, but something I've been getting a ton of questions about for a few years now. So I figured it's out there. And from now on, I have something to point people to um, on the drum track. So if you have any more questions, drop them in the chat and um, sign off here in just a bit. Oh, this is actually a pretty good question. Um, what instrument should you track first? Ooh, the way I like to do it, it's kind of down to your own workflow, but I like to start with a scratch guitar track. And this is sort of what we did the other day. So um, I have this muted right now, but I'll solo it. So this was 
just me trying to get the idea down for the song. So I pulled up a guitar sound and uh, I just started playing. I had a click turned on. I knew the tempo that I wanted. Um, but before there was ever a drum sound or anything pulled up, I just had the guitar track. And uh, let's see, is this going to be bust to the right thing here? Yes. So this was just the... Wait. Oh, wait. I'm still... Here we go. So essentially, you see how all these regions are clipped here. This is not the order of the chord progression that I played. I basically just kind of noodled different chords around for a few minutes and then went back and I chopped everything up and rearranged it so it kind of made sense for the, the sound we're going for. And then from that, I used that as a general guide for two things, for the drums, whether it's a drum loop or we're programming drums, and then for the bass. So I'll do a scratch guitar first, get the layout of the song done, then I'll do my drum tracks, my bass tracks, then mute the, the scratch guitar and then start tracking my actual guitars and other instruments on top of it. That's how I work, but that doesn't mean that's how you have to do it. Everyone's kind of different and in their own thing. Um, who won the small pedal board contest? Like I said, we have a winner picked, but they have not responded to their email, letting us know uh, that they know they won and giving us a shipping address. So if they don't respond in the next day or two, we're going to pick another winner. So for now, the the wait continues. All right, everyone. Well, thank you guys so much. Uh, one more plug. Remember to check out the Inner Circle. And uh, I think there's only like one or two of those coupons left for 50% off of uh, any of the video courses. So check that out if you haven't done so already. I really appreciate everyone hanging out. I know this was, again, a little bit outside of what I typically do here. But uh, yeah, hope you enjoyed it. And uh, I will see you guys next week for the next Tuesday Live. See y'all.